Please welcome our lead pastor, Jeff Inglehart, as he comes to minister. Good morning. How many are expecting this morning? How many are expecting? Come on, say it again. There is something about expectancy, and when you have expectancy, there's something that begins to happen. There's an excitement that's created within you to start believing for things that you stopped believing for. Think about this for a moment. There were people that had been looking for a Messiah. The prophet Isaiah, it was 700 years before Christ came and he prophesied of Jesus' coming. Then we have the prophet Zechariah, which Matthew quoted, and that was 500 years before Jesus came. And they were expecting, everybody say expecting. They were expecting a savior. They were expecting a savior. What I found in this lesson this week is when I was reading the story over again, and I already know the story very, very well, but as I was reading it again, I thought, you know, isn't it amazing that here there's an expectation of something for centuries? For centuries. An expectation that went generational for centuries. And it wasn't fulfilled yet. But it was always talked about. It's those things that get passed down generationally from one generation to the next generation. It's an expectation of this is coming. He's coming. He's coming. And it was taught to the children. It was taught to the adults. It was taught to everyone in the synagogues that a Messiah, a Savior was coming. So 500 years before Christ the Messiah came, Zechariah prophesied of Jesus. And can I tell you, never stop expecting. Never stop expecting. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, never stop expecting. When you stop expecting, your faith gets diminished. When you stop expecting, your faith is diminished. So you need to keep expecting. You need to keep believing. Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9 says, this, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, a foal of the beast of burden. It's easy to get caught up in the, the depressing events of day-to-day -day life that can sometimes be depressing. You know what I'm saying? We, we have great days, we have good days, but then there's some days that if we're just truthful to ourselves, it's really not that great some days. Sometimes we go through the dark valleys in our life and we lose our perspective and live as people without hope. But the book of Zechariah serves as a correction for, the tenden for that tendency in our very own lives. We have hope that is sure and Zechariah points to that hope and that hope is Jesus even though he was pointing to it 500 years before Jesus ever came. Jesus entering to Jerusalem on a donkey fits the broad narrative that the crowd rejoiced because they acknowledged Jesus was king. However, they had different understanding of his kingship. You know, there can be sometimes that we're expecting something, but it might not come the way that we're looking for. It might appear to you, but it might appear differently to you. But I can say from the scriptures that God always does something better than what we've expected. And he always does something more than what we needed. Huh? And so when they cried Hosanna, they were saying, save us, Lord. Hosanna, save us, please. Save us from the tyranny of the Romans. They were seeking earthly salvation from their enemies. They were asking Jesus to make Israel a significant world power again, just like the days of King David and just like the days of Solomon. Although they had been expecting for centuries for this Messiah would come, they had preconceived ideas on how he would come and what he would look like and what he would do. And Jesus even though he fulfilled all, what, all the, what the prophets had declared beforehand, who he was and what he would do, they still didn't see who he was. Their perception, they missed it somehow. They missed it somehow. 
Let me ask you this question this morning. Is what you're expecting going to manifest the way you hoped? Don't miss it if it looks different. Because I guarantee it'll be better than what you're expecting. Jesus' arrival on a donkey symbolized his peaceful intentions. In the past, in, in the past uh, encountering God meant sometimes even death, but Jesus came to bring peace and not war. Matter of fact, when Jesus came in on a donkey, he wasn't, he wasn't coming in as a king because a king would have been coming in on the finest bred horse, on a strong steed. That's how they would come in or they'd come in on a chariot. Jesus didn't do those as he came in on a donkey speaking of peace, not war. The people thought that Jesus was coming to rescue and free them now, but he was coming to free them from the sin that bound them and exceed their expectations by giving them more. Hope for today and realized hope for tomorrow and most of all, eternal life. Once again, let me ask you today, What are you expecting? What are you expecting? You see, Jesus was coming for a bigger picture to connect God back to people. He came to be the once and for all sacrifice, the sacrifice that could be done, that could now could be all done away with because of him laying his life freely down. He was coming to give them and us eternal life eternal liberty, not just temporary liberty. I like what Proverbs chapter three, verses five through six says. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Seek his will and all you do and he will show you which path to take. You see, don't put limitations on your expectations. Don't put limitations on, oh, someone needs to say that to somebody next to you. Don't put limitations on your expectations. Don't put the limitations on your expectations. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can hope, think, even imagine. Isn't that what the Bible says? Those things are only realized by trust and dependence upon the Holy Spirit. So the only way that we're going to be able to realize what we're expecting is if we say, Holy Spirit, I need you to reveal what it's going to look like to me. I need you to reveal to me the future plans. I need you to reveal to me what the future looks like in those areas. And he'll come back to you and say, well, let's take it day by day, step by step. You know, the Bible says that we only see in part. He doesn't show us everything at once. We, we look through glasses darkly so we don't always see everything at once but he wants to show you glimpse he wants to show you these these snapshots of what the future is going to look like so that way all of a sudden you can get excited about those snapshots and when you finally get there you'll realize look what god has done look what god has done keep expecting and in other words trust in the lord with all your heart Never rely on what you think you know. If you bank on it one way only, you may miss it altogether. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he shall guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he shall declare unto the things that are yet to come. We have to build our expectation and our dependency upon the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, what's happening today? What do you have planned for me today? If you think about this, he's the very creator of the world, the very creator of the universe. And all he's saying is, press into me. I'm gonna reveal to you my plans the very plan that I have for your life. The Bible says that men make plans for themselves, but God directs their steps. You see, we can all make plans and plans are good. Matter of fact, I I have plans all the time. They don't always work out the way I want them to work out. 
Only in my plays do they usually work out that way. You know what I'm saying? But there's plans that you make. There's plans that you devise and you say, okay, it's got to go this way. And then you offer it to the Lord and say, okay, God, here it is. And then he looks at it and he smiles and he says, I've got something bigger and I've got something better. And he begins to change the trajectory of your life or he changes your expectation or he brings about your expectation, but he does it so much bigger and so much better. What are you expecting? What are you expecting for? Whatever it is, you need to press into the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I want to see what the Father's expectation is of this expectation that I have. Because he wants to show you something broader. He wants to show you something that's new and something that's fresh. That was, that was one thing. So the same crowd that said to Jesus, Messiah, Son of God, save us, and Hosanna, and all these things, at the beginning of the week, when it came Friday, some of those same ones were yelling, crucify him, and shouting death to him. How come? Let's look at that. If you're taking notes today, there's, there's three things. There's when Jesus approaches our lives, we have three possible reactions. The first one is false expectation, expectation resistance, and humble expectation. Let me explain it like this. The first one is false expectation. There are people in the crowd shouting Hosanna that was joining in because everyone else was. Are you one of the people that are joining in just because everybody else is? Or are you joining in because you really have that expectation of God, I want to praise you. I want to worship you. I want to praise you because you're good. And I want to worship you just for who you are. Are you joining in in the in the sound and the song of life in that manner with God? Are you are you pressing in or are you pressing in with false expectation, with false praise? I'm doing it because everybody else is doing it. They were the same ones that turned on him by the end of the week and false expectation of praise involves seeking personal gain without truly recognizing Jesus' lordship. Ouch. You see, when we have that, when we have that false expectation, when we encounter Christ and that false expectation is there and all of a sudden we just falsely and we just kind of fake it till you make it or, or whatever you do. I'm not sure what it is, but when you enter in falsely with an expectation, when it comes to Jesus, let me just tell you, you're thinking about personal gain without truly recognizing his lordship in your life. You're almost saying, what can he do for me? It's like, let's make a deal. You know, God's not into making the deal. It's that mentality of what can he do for me? Or, or we praise him when we are around certain people and act totally different when we're around other people. Oh, come on. There's one more room for a hypocrite in the place. Come on. Isn't that right? None of, none of us, none of us in this room are perfect, right? In some way and somehow, many of us are probably hypocrites. You've heard me say it before. You, you didn't read, you didn't read the whole, all the language on your cell phone. And yet you said you read it and you, you accept all the policies of it. Unless you were a lawyer and you understood it all, you didn't read it, right? And so we're liars. That's a nice feeling, isn't it? Who's got a cell phone? Just raise your hand. Yeah. See, we're surrounded. We're in good company, right? None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. God is not after perfection in our life. He wants us to be real with him and he wants to have this, he wants to have this personal relationship with us to say, listen, Jeff, your expectation is this. Your expectation is over here. And you're, and you're very zealous about all this. Matter of fact, Destiny and I had this talk this week. I don't remember if it was on our trip to Ann Arbor or, or where it was, but we were talking about the scripture and she said, you know, dad, Saul had an expectation. He really, he really thought he was doing good. 
He really thought he was doing good by by killing these Christians because these Christians were following Jesus. And he really thought he was doing good and he had all this passion. He had all this zeal and he was expecting. But then when he had an encounter with Jesus, it changed his life. And Jesus even changed his name from Saul to the apostle Paul. And he gave, he took that zeal and he took that power and he took all those things in his life and he changed the trajectory of his life. And he said, now I want you to use that same zeal and that same expectancy, but over here. See, sometimes we're just misguided in our expectancy, aren't we? So what are we expecting? What are we expecting? Only 10 more pages to go. No, just kidding. Number two is this. Resistant expectation. Resistant expectation arises when we perceive his lordship as a threat to the way of our life. God, I'll serve you if. God, I'll serve you but. Huh? Huh? Now, I'm not pointing anybody in this room. A few weeks ago, I had to have an uncomfortable conversation with someone. And it wasn't, it wasn't to point out their sin. It was just to have a conversation with them. And as I was having a conversation with them, I said, you know what? And I read a scripture in the Bible. And I says, you know, it says liars, thieves, adulterers, fornicators, those in homosexuality. I mean, I just kept listing all the lists that's there. And I says, well, not inherit the kingdom of God. It's talking about you not inherit the power of God in this life. Okay? It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about you'll not inherit the kingdom of God, meaning the kingdom of God manifested right now in your life, the power of God in your life. And I looked at them and I said, I'm not here to judge you. I said, Holy Spirit works on every one of us. And if you read that scripture with me, you'd realize that all of us are named somewhere in that list because none of us are perfect, right? But resistant expectation happens when we read the word and we know what the word says and we still do what we want to do because the word doesn't line up with how we want to live. That's resistant expectation. Does that make sense? And so what the Holy Spirit is challenging us today is he's saying, you know what? I don't want you to live with a resistance. I don't want you to live with that resistant expectation because when it arises, when you perceive his lordship and it's threatening your way of life, because being a believer doesn't mean like, it doesn't mean live like you want. Instead, it actually means pressing into him for what he has planned for your life. If the Bible says that he's come to give us abundant life, don't you think that he's got great things in store for you? If it's an abundant full life, don't you think he has over the top, off the chart kind of things planned for your life? I do. I do. Once I started realizing who the father was, how good he was and how wonderful he is, and that he knows the number of hairs on my head, and that he's called me by name, and that he knew me when I was in my mother's womb, when I was being formed, all these things, I think, God, you are so good, you're so wonderful. And all those things that I heard about other people talk about when I was growing up, about how bad or how God's going to get you or whatever, you know, I'm thank God that wasn't my parents. They not only told me how God was, but they also showed me how a loving father and mother respond. I'm blessed in that area. Not everybody gets that opportunity to have that in their life. But when you have a a resistant expectation, you're saying, God, I want to love you and I want to enjoy the things of you, but don't touch that area of my life. That's mine. I want to continue in that sin. Ouch. And we resist his lordship. Matthew chapter 10, verse 39 says this, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. You see, 
when we're willing to lay down our desires, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit starts filling his desires into our life, and they bring fulfillment, they bring joy, they bring peace, they bring faith. I mean, they, you know, talk about move mountains. We were singing it this morning. That's the kind of thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to challenge your life. And when your life isn't being challenged, you're just, you're just going through life, doing the mundane things. But he actually wants to challenge your life. He wants to give a little excitement in your life. Oh, I, I, know, I know that when every time you went through a pressing, you thought, well, God, you know, help me get out of this. And, but you know what? Sometimes, sometimes God allows the pressing in our life or the uncomfortable things in our life because he's trying to press us together because the Bible says, press down, shaken together, running over in good measure. God wants to not only get something to you, he wants to get an abundant to you, but he wants you to overflow the abundance out of your life. And you can't have it if you're resistant in your expectation. Number three, and this is my last point, and I'm coming to a close. It's my longest point. No, no, just kidding. It's this, humble expectation. Humble expectation. You see what was happening that whole weekend of the triumphal entry with Jesus coming into Jerusalem is there were those in the religious realms that were resistant with resistant expectation because they knew their jobs were on the line. They knew that something, their system was about to be changed. This man is coming to change everything. And so there was resistant expectation. But then there was other people that truly we're looking for the promise of the Messiah. And they actually saw Jesus do the things that the, that the prophets throughout, throughout the centuries had said he was going to do. And they're like, he fulfills every one of those prophecies. He must be the Messiah. And so they humbly, with humble expectation, they received who he was. You see, humble expectation involves acknowledging our shortcomings and surrendering to Jesus as Lord and King. This week, when we say Hosanna, when we say blessed is, the, is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and every day of, of, of every morning when you get up to say your prayers, or every night you, go to, you lay your head down on the pillow and you say your prayers, whenever that is, I want you to always remember, God, I'm humbly submitting my way for your way. Do you know what submission means? It means I'm going to submit my mission for yours. Submission. I'm going to sub my mission. I'm going to put it down. I'm going to submit it to you for your mission. You're going to have joy. You're going to have peace. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials and tribulations. They're always going to be with us. Someone say, ouch, I, I, I know. Trials and tribulations, the Bible said, will always be with you. But Jesus said that he's come to make a, way, make a way for us with humble expectation. Look what James chapter 4, verse 6 says. He resists the proud, but gives grace. He gives grace, meaning he gives favor to the humble. If you're looking for God's grace in your life, if you're looking for God's favor in your life, then live a humble life. Live a humble life. That, that just means that you're, that you're humble before the Father. And you're saying, Lord, I'm submitting to you. When you when, do you know when you raise your hands in worship, you know what you're saying? When you're raising your hands in worship, you're saying, God, I'm, I'm submitting to you. That, 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 that's, that's one of the greatest things you can do in worship is, is lift your hand and say, God, I'm submitting to you. Not my way, but your way. Not my will, but your will be done. I'm, I'm submitting to you. And when you think about it, when Jesus stretched out his arms, when he stretched out his arms for us, what he was saying is, in humble adoration to the Father, is he was saying, God, I love you.
I'm humbly submitting to you. I'm submitting to your will. You know, Thursday is coming. And if you're of a traditional background, they'll celebrate Monday, Thursday. And it really, it's just talking about, it was when Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples. And it says that Jesus humbly humbled himself and he washed each one of the disciples' feet. He spent an enormous time with them all all night that night before they got up to go to the garden to pray. And it was in that time, it was in that moment that when he was breaking the bread and passing the cup, and our deacons are coming right now to do that very thing, and they're going to pass out the emblems to us today, and and we're going to receive communion. And as they pass those out right now, I want us to remember today, the wafer is a reminder of the body of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he was beaten beyond recognition, that his beard was plucked until blood flowed, that his back with a cat of nine tails was ripped to shreds. Josephus says that his ribs were exposed from his backside because of the torment and the pain of the nine lashes or the the nine cat of nine tails that he bore on his back. And the Bible says that by his stripes, by those very stripes, he said, I've healed you. By those very stripes, I've healed you. And so when we're partaking of communion today, we're remembering what Christ has done for us. It was so much more than a temporary relief from suffering. It was it was a forever and for always thing. It was I'm I'm doing this once. I'm not having to do it again. I'm only having to do it once and I'm doing it because I love you so much. I love all those that have come before me. I love all those that are here now, and I love all those that are coming after me. That's what he's saying when he stretched his arms out and they nailed his hands and his feet to a cross. And he said, that's how much I love you. And he extended his arms out. The juice represents his blood today. The Bible says that his blood washes our sins and makes us whiter than snow. You know what I said about that list in the Bible that says, you know, if you're doing these things, and I listed all those sins that people do, do you realize that his blood washes you whiter than snow? And when you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, he immediately cleanses you from all unrighteousness. And the Bible says, one of my favorite chapters in the book, in Colossians chapter 3, that you're hidden in Christ. You're seated with Christ. So every time the Father looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees forgiven, and he calls you by name. That's what he's done for you. That's what he's done for you. That's what he's done for me. So as we partake of that today, So let's pray, can we? Lord, thank you. Thank you that this wafer represents your body that was broken for us. It was broken for us. You were beaten for us. By your stripes, we've been made whole. Thank you that you came and you broke the expectation of the day, that you exceeded the expectation of the day, the expectation of the centuries, God. Thank you. Jesus, thank you for doing that. Thank you for willingly laying down your life for us. And the Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we receive today together collectively your body of believers, 
your body that you broke for us in Jesus' name. The Bible says that night, he also took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now you have to remember they were on, they were on the other side of the cross. They didn't understand what he was even talking about half the time. They were trying to tune in with an expectation of, we're trying to figure out what you're saying, but we're on the other side of the cross. We know what he was saying because we're on the right side of the cross. We're on the finished work side of the cross. But his disciples were on the other side of the cross, and they didn't know what he was saying, didn't know what he was talking about. And so they passed, they passed the cup, and he said, do this often as we meet together. And he says, take, this is my blood, which was shed for the remission of sins. And he said, drink ye all of it. And so, Lord, we th- Jesus, we thank you for giving your life on a cross for us. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. Thank you for laying down your life freely and willfully for us. Thank you that you had an expectation knowing what you and the Father and the Holy Spirit had planned before the foundations of the world, that you had a plan to redeem men and women. Thank you for that. We receive that forgiveness of our sins today. And we thank you for doing what you did for us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Now, these are my questions for you today. Well, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says this. It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. All things shall be added unto you. When you're in a humble state of receiving When your hands are out, you're ready to receive. When you're in that kind of a state and you're reading his word and you're applying his word to your life, you know what happens? You're seeking God in his kingdom. You're placing him first. And he says, all these other things, the desires of your heart, all these other things you've desired, I'm going to start giving them to you one by one. That's what it means. Say all. 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 He wants to give you all things, all things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. These are my questions for us today. What are you banking your expectation on? What are you banking your expectations on? Will you recognize it if it's different? Will you recognize it if it's different? Just like we learned in the story today, some recognized who he was. Others didn't recognize him at all. And they were expecting something else, and they missed it. Have you asked the Holy Spirit about it? Have you asked the Holy Spirit about your expectation, what you're expecting, what you're believing for? Have you asked the Holy Spirit about it? Here's here's another question for all of us. Do you have a false expectation, a resistant expectation? Are you resistant or are you humble, ready to receive all that God has for your life? Would you stand with me this morning? Our prayer team is coming this morning, and they're here to pray with you. Our elders are coming as well. They're going to be here to pray with you this morning. Maybe you're that person that is saying, you know what? I'm struggling in this area with, I'm a little resistant. There's things in my life that I, I want to hold on to. There's things in my life that I want to still do. And you know what? Thanks for being honest. But I want you to know that Jesus wants to help you overcome that in your area, in that area of your life. He wants to help you overcome that area in your life. Maybe you're that person that has a false expectation that you just want to go around with the crowd, but You're really on the fence about your Christianity and what you believe. Jesus wants to give you an experience with him, an experience with him. And I don't want just to rush out the door today. I I really want you to press in today. I really want you to press in. You, You can do that from your seat or you can come up here 
and pray with prayer partners today, but I really want you to press in and say, Holy Spirit, I need you. I need, I need your revelation. I, I, need, I need to have that expectation of you. And if your word says it, I want to experience it. I don't want to just talk about it. If your word says it, I want to experience it. So you can come forward and you can do that today. For the rest of us, let me give you, let me give you a prayer of blessing. Father, I thank you that you bless us on our coming in today. You're blessing us on our going out and our lying down and our rising up. Everything we put our hands to, God, I thank you that it's blessed. I thank you, God, that we're not going to be the people that have a false expectation or a false praise just to see what you can do for us. I also thank you, God, that we're not the people that are going to have a resistant expectation of when we read your word, we're going to apply it to our lives. We're going to change because we want to become in the image of the Father. We want to become all that you have desired for us to become. And so, God, I thank you for that. Lord, we're going to be the people with humble expectation to humbly lay down our desires for your desire. And Lord, I thank you for that today. I thank you, Lord, that every one of us, you loved us, you accepted us. I thank you that we belong, and I thank you, God, that you have a purpose for our lives. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Just before you move from your seat today, whether to come forward or to stay in your seat for a little while, let me ask this question. Friend, if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ, you never asked him in on your life journey, today's your day. Don't be resistant to him today, but say, I need you today. I desire you today. And if that's you, and if you need Jesus, would you do me a favor? Would you just text Jesus to the number 989 989- 625-9300. I want to make sure we get a booklet to you that can help you in your newfound faith. I'll send you a little text message just to see how you're doing. You can text me, ask me questions. I want to help you in your newfound faith. If that's you, do that today. Amen? Amen. For the rest of us, God bless your week.